started, please do keep your mics off during the presentation, but feel free to message and chat with any questions you might have. We'll have some Q&A time following the presentation, and we'll get to everything then. So for those of you who do not know me and those who do, my name is Adam, and I'm the Community Engagement Librarian for Adams Memorial. Uh, I am happy to introduce this evening the library's favorite storyteller, Charles Kiernan, member of the Lehigh Valley Storytelling Guild, who happens to suffer under the delusion he is Mark Twain. And for our benefit tonight, that is very fortunate. Thank you for joining us, Charles. Oh, good evening. I'm so happy to be here with you all. Before we get started, I'd like to anticipate a question you might have, which is, Mr. Twain, if you died in 1910, why are you still here bothering us? Well, I died and went to heaven. That surprised a great many of people. I found, though, that heaven was kind of boring. Well, it's because my friends weren't there, so I went to find them. Satan wouldn't let me into hell, which is where I thought most of my friends would be. Uh, he said I was too hot to handle. So I'm stuck here in the middle. It could be worse. I could be in Cincinnati. I'd like to thank the, the good people of the Adams Memorial Library for giving me the opportunity to annoy their patrons with my ramblings. I always have a lot to say, and generally the good sense not to say it. I can talk about any topic, anywhere, anytime, whether I know anything about it or not. However, I've found it um, expeditious to stick to one subject when I am talking to an audience. And therefore, tonight I will violate that rule immediately and address two questions that has often, often been asked of me, uh, but they are related. Uh, the first is, why did you become an author? And the second was, why didn't you come to your senses and get a real job? Well, early in my career, I did have some real jobs. When my father died, my mother apprenticed me out to a printer to learn the trade of typesetting. After a while, my brother, Orion, the rising star of the family, purchased a local newspaper and installed me as a typesetter on family wages. I didn't mind. It gave me a chance to write. I would write anonymous letters to the editor. And since I was a typesetter, they they usually saw print. Then came the time when my brother Orion had to go on a business trip and leave me in charge. Well, I immediately wrote an editorial that Lamb based the editor of the competing newspaper, the Tri Weekly Messenger. Well, I drummed up a scandal based on a certain amount of fact, and he answered me in print. Oh, we soon had an editorial war going on, increased the circulation of both our papers uh, until Orion returned and spoiled the fun. But it did, did give me a taste for writing. Well, I practiced the trade of typesetting for a number of years until on the strength of a $50 bill that I found blowing around in the streets, uh, I took passage on a steamboat heading for New Orleans. I didn't really know where I was going. I had a thought to maybe go to the Amazon, but I was ready for a change. Well, during that trip, I fell into conversation with one of the pilots, Mr. Horace Bixby. And I talked to him into taking me on as a cub pilot, a pilot in training. 
Well, given that opportunity, I, I couldn't help myself. Growing up on the river, I only had two uh, occupations in mind for my future. First was to run away with a circus. The second was to become a steamboat man. Hannibal, Missouri, and where I grew up was a sleepy southern town, baking in the summer sun. The steamboat came around a bend in the river, pilot blowing the whistle. A drunk sleeping on the dock would wake up and call out, steamboat's coming. And all the people would come drifting out of the shops and the houses. And we'd see the great wheel stop turning and then begin to backpedal as a pilot eased the boat into the dock. Well, someone would throw out a mooring line, someone would wrap it around a pier post. Then the gangplank would come down and finely dressed men and women would get on and off. And the boom would sweep across, loading and unloading crates of machinery and bales of cotton in and out of the hull of the boat. And the crew would be swearing and shouting, oh, such a glorious commotion. And then the pilot would give a warning blast on the whistle and the passengers would scurry back onto the boat. Gangplank would go up, lines would be cast off. And we'd see that great wheel turn with sheaths of water falling off of the blade. Pilot would nose the boat back out to the river, catch a current and soon disappear around another bend in the river until all we saw was the smoke belching from the great stacks above the tree line. Now the drunk would fall asleep on the dock again. Hannibal would return to its synobalistic state. Well, Mr. Bixby, he charged me a princely sum to, uh, for my apprenticeship as a cub pilot, but it was to be taken out of my wages as a licensed pilot. So I didn't care. I had a bed to sleep in, I had food to eat, and I was going to be a riverboat pilot. <laughs> had I any idea how hard that was going to be? I, I never would have had the courage to start. For the next two years, Mr. Bixby cursed at me, uh, humiliated me, played tricks on me, and learned me the river. As he put it, I had to know the shape of the river, which is akin to memorizing the movements of a serpent. The river was always changing, a course finding a new way, a sandbar shifting, moving along ever so slowly, uh, snags and boulders just below the surface of the water ready to tear out the bottom of the boat. These boats ran all day and all night, even in the fog. A pilot had to know where they were and the shape of the river ahead of them. They also had to know how to read the bank of the river to judge the rise and the fall of the water, which was critical. Oh, there was other arcane bits of knowledge they had to know, which I won't bore you with. But it was a challenging job. I was up for the challenge. 1859, I got my riverboat pilot license. For two more glorious years, I was a riverboat pilot. And there I would have stayed. Never become a scribbler, except for the Civil War breaking out. Cut the river in half. There was no commerce on the river during the war. I was out of a job. Well, who should come to my rescue but my brother Orion? Remember Orion? He had just gotten a job as secretary to the governor of the Nevada territories. And he offered to take me along. Well, I jumped at the opportunity to get away from the great conflagration. We went out by stagecoach. Uh, that was an adventure all in itself. Uh, I kept a journal, which 
became my notes for a future book called Roughing It. But at the time, I didn't have an inkling that I was going to be an author someday. Well, when we got out there, um, I tried my hand at silver mining, but that didn't pan out. Uh, tried my hand at lumbering, but all I succeeded in doing was starting a forest fire. But I had been a typesetter. I had laid out acres and acres of good writing and acres and acres of bad writing, and I had come to know the difference. I took the job as a newspaper reporter. I worked for the Virginia City Territorial Enterprise, uh, San Francisco Daily Morning Call, oh, Sacramento Union, and Alta California at one time or another. It was around that time I started using the gnome de plume of Mark Twain. Well, as time passed, one day I found myself staying in a rundown, dirt floor log cabin uh, at a place called Jackass Hill. I was there hiding from the um, uh, chief of police of uh, San Francisco. Well, I had published an article critical of his himself and his department. He considered that as breaking the law. While I was there, um, one of my compatriots told a rollicking good story about two men betting on jumping frogs. So I added a bit of my own humor to it and got it published in a newspaper as the celebrated jumping frog of Calaveras County. Well, it was then picked up by another newspaper and then another and until I had a, a national presence and a reputation. What well, led me to know that I could be an author? Well, I soon published my first book, The Jumping Frog of Calaveras County and Other Sketches. And to my surprise, it was a failure. I had to go back to my day job. The uh, Sacramento Union uh, gave me the assignment of being a, a travel writer, in my case, a humorous travel writer, to the Sandwich Islands. Uh, you know it better as the Hawaiian Islands. There's much interest in the islands at that time because of sugar plantations that were being established there. Sugar being a hot commodity, uh, both commercially and politically. And also, there was a, a sea harbor there that the United States Navy uh, thought might be of um, strategic interest to them, uh, Pearl Harbor. Also, there was an exotic location, uh, tropical, with volcanoes. Uh, what could be more interesting? Well, I wrote back to my newspaper letters. We would now call them articles, uh, describing my adventures and the sites that are there to be seen. Well, I was very successful at that. And when I returned to the States, I, I tried to get them published as a book, but ah, to no avail. But I was successful when I took these Sandwich Island adventures and turned them in, into a traveling lecture. I became known or became part of what was known as the Lyceum Circuit. We were traveling acrobats, um, artists, minstrels, the animal magnetists, and humorists. Uh, we traveled on a schedule from town to town, uh, performing in the town halls, uh, social halls, churches, and, and opera houses. Oh, we were the, the entertainment of the day. These tours were organized by um, a business manager who arranged for all the rail passage and the, the lodgings. And, uh, the whole thing was because of the expansion of the railroads. Uh, they were now connecting every city in the United States. And that's what made this whole thing possible. 
Well, the schedule was grueling, but the uh, profits were adequate. I could always depend on a, a good amount of money whenever I toured, which I did pretty much for the, the rest of my life. Now, th this tour it took me to, um, this one on the Hawaiian Islands, took me to New York City, where I got a window through the grapevine and later we became talk of the town uh, scheme for a transatlantic uh, tour of Europe. Well, I had contacted Alta California, whom I was a roving reporter for, asked them if they would pay for my passage uh, in exchange for 50 letters documenting this event. Well, it constituted the, the first luxury tour of Americans to Europe. We were going to be the first American tourists. Uh, the ship scheduled to, um, for this event was the Quaker City, a, a steamship built before the Civil War. Uh, during the war, it had gone along the coast of the Atlantic into the Gulf of Mexico, enforcing the Union blockade of the Confederate States. But after the war, that they turned it into a luxury uh, passenger ship. Well, the Alta California people, they funded my ticket, and uh, I soon found myself aboard the Quaker City. My roommate turned out to be an immoral, wine-drinking, tobacco-smoking, godless man. Perfect companion for me. Uh, and he was one of the, the better wits aboard the Gray Star Company, uh, Daniel Slopes by name. Also aboard was Mary Fairbanks, a uh, woman with whom I kept up correspondence, a serious correspondence uh, the rest of my life, along with a few other people. But most of the company was made up of pious people. Fair game for my sense of humor. Well, our itinerary uh, included France, uh, Italy, Egypt, and the promised Holy Lands. We cruised the Atlantic Ocean, uh, Mediterranean Sea, and the Black Sea. We toured Greek and Roman ruins and oh, a countless number of cathedrals. We even luncheoned with Tsar Alexander II and uh, Tsarina Maria their uh, summer castle uh, palace in Yalta, uh, in whom I'm sure counted the silverware after we left. Well, after about, um, oh, little anecdote. Our, um, one of our companions, more liberal of the, of the people there, uh, young Mr. Blutcher, he, when we made our first landfall, which was the Azores, took nine of us uh, out to dinner ashore, complete with uh, wine and cigars. Now the currency there, uh, it's called the Reyes. And this meal when the restaurant owner presented the bill to young Mr. Butcher was 21,700 Reyes. We were thunderstruck. Young Blitcher thought he was financially ruined. Well, we felt quite sorry for him. Uh, but his anxiety abated when we found out the exchange rate was 1,000 reyes to a penny. The actual bill was uh, $21.70. More refreshments were ordered. Oh, we were innocents abroad. Well, after about six months of the voyage, we all returned home. Before that, a very important passenger for me was uh, the young Charles Langdon of Elmira, New York, uh, a member of a prominent family in that city. During a conversation with him, 
he showed me a locket that held a little portrait of his sister, Olivia. When I saw that image, I decided that was a girl I must marry. So after we had all returned home, um, I wheedled an invitation from Charles to visit his family when they were staying in New York City for a while. Well, Olivia was more than a match for her portrait. Uh, I was in her company when, uh, with her, she and her family, when one evening we went to listen to a reading by a rising English author, uh, Mr. Charles Dickens. Well, later that year, I visited them in Elmira for about two weeks. Uh, with the intent to court Livy. Uh, well, that courtship went nowhere. But uh, a little while later, I was back again just for an overnight stay. And the next morning, uh, Charles and I got into an open coach that was to take us back to the train station. Uh, the horse bolted and sent us rolling head over heels onto the ground and I severely hit my head. I, I saw stars. Well, they picked me up and they carried me back into Langdon household. And Olivia nursed me back to health. Well, we were married less than two years after that. Uh, but not until after she had uh, rejected my proposal three times. Oh, but that's not what I came here to tell you about. What, what was my subject? Oh, why I became an author. Well, whatever fabrications I've been telling you, uh, the real reason I became an author was I like the limelight. Being on the Lyceum circuit, uh, even though how hard that was Oh, constant travel, cheap hotels, doubtful food, being away from family. Whenever I stepped out on the stage into the limelight, I was in my element. I must confess, I've always craved recognition. I am never happier until I know somebody knows who I am. Well, my, my notoriety increased, and I, I thought everyone knew my name, which turned out uh, not to be the case one day. Um, I was in Washington, D.C., in the company of Bill Stewart, the um, senator of Nevada, whom I knew from a time spent in Nevada. And he offered to introduce me to President Grant. Well, I said I'd be honored. Well, when President Grant heard my, my name in the introduction, he looked at me waiting for further explanation. I realized he had no idea who I was. I said, Mr. President, I am embarrassed. Uh, are you? Well, he gave me a little mirthless smile, and I left with my tail between my legs. Uh, ten years later, um, after my notoriety had moved on to being notorious, I met him again. Uh, after his presidency, his popularity never waned. He was coming off of a world tour. He was making his way from the West Coast back to the East with great fanfare. He was going to be honored in Chicago by the Army of the Tennessee, which had been his first command. The uh, committee organizers asked me to uh, come and to the banquet and be one of the speakers. And I said, I'd be most happy to do so. Well, when I got there, um, I found out there's going to be, the organizers had created a, a parade uh, for General Grant to view from the 
uh, rostrum that was built out from the second story of the Palmer Hotel. Oh, it was complete with carpeting and flag bunting for the occasion. Well, I knew that was going to be the best place to view the parade, so I snuck out there early, and I hope that once I was there, they wouldn't kick me off. Well, after a time, two more men came out. The first was the mayor of Chicago, whom I knew, and the second was General Grant. Well, as the crowd below was cheering General Grant, the mayor came over to me and asked me if I would like to meet General Grant, and I said that I should. Well, upon our second um, introduction, Grant looked at me and he said, I'm not embarrassed, are you? Completing our conversation of a decade earlier. Yeah. Uh, to be in the limelight was one of the reasons I moved to Hartford, Connecticut. Hartford at the time was maybe the wealthiest city in the country. It was populated with artists and reformers, and thinkers, writers, and big time industrialists. It was also the home of the American Publishing Company who were about to publish my book, uh, Innocence Abroad, and published a number of my other titles. Our next door neighbor was Harriet Beecher Stowe of Uncle Tom's Cabin fame. Uh, but Harriet was uh, very old by then and no longer in her right mind. Uh, she didn't distinguish between her property and our property. She would wander around our yard and pick our flowers and then wander into our house and for reasons we never understood, uh, tiptoe up behind an unsuspecting person and let out with a shrill war hoop enough to jump a person out of their clothing. Another one of our neighbors was um, Charles Dudley Warren, a fellow writer with whom I, I wrote, co-wrote my, my first novel, uh, The Gilded Age. Now, Warren and I didn't uh, borrow that phrase. Uh, it was our book that gave the phrase, that name to that period. Yes, Warren and I invented the term, the Gilded Age. And what an age it was. Oh, our, our book uh, satirized its, um, its corruption and its greed, but there was more to it than that. It was a time of uncommon progress. For example, um, when Orion and I uh, were on that stagecoach out to Nevada, we were very keen to see a Pony Express rider. So we told our, our coach driver, let us know if he saw one. One day he shouted down to us, here he comes. Uh, we stuck our heads out of those little coach windows, Orion and I. There on the horizon, it was a dot, but coming at us hell bent on speed. And as he got closer, we could make out the small horse and a rider. The rider was just a lad. He was riding a slip of a saddle covered with a leather apron and the four corners of which were sewn mail bags. And we knew that every letter in that mail bag was written on onion skin paper. Everything was a weight consideration. The writer carried a, a water bottle, a pistol, and a Bible, and that was it. And he had on tight fitting clothing and a skull cap. Oh, no floppy hat with a jacket with buckskin flapping in the air. Now he was hunched over the saddle to cut down on the wind resistance. And when he got close to us, he, he flicked a finger just in recognition of us. And, as he sped past us, foam from the horse's mouth uh, flecked along the side of the coach, and then they were disappearing as quickly as they'd come. Ah, we were inspired. That was progress. That was America. The mail was going from 
St. Jota, Sacramento in seven, seven days, I think, was the record. The Pony Express lasted 18 months. It was outdone by the telegraph. Now, instead of days, it was only hours to get a message across the United States. When the Civil War started, I had a cousin, Arabella Clements, who got on a wagon train with our family on her way to Oregon. She kept a diary. She wrote about fending off the Indians and fording rivers and breaking down a mountain pass. It took them months to get out there. By the end of that decade, you could get on a train in the east, dine in the dining car, and be on the west coast in a couple of days. There was never an age of um, more rapid progress. I do, it was, well, it was just nothing less than incredible. As horrible as the Civil War was, it did spur on invention. As a lad, if we wanted to communicate, well, we either talked or we wrote a letter if we knew how. By the time I was an adult, uh, well, in my Hartford home, uh, in my lobby, I, I built a little booth to house our telephone. We could now talk to each other electronically if someone else had a phone at the other end. Oh, I, I visited um, Edison in his laboratory in New Jersey. He recorded my voice. I also visited Nikola Tesla in his laboratory with all of his electronic wonders. Oh, it, it was an incredible period of invention and, and progress. It has its upsides and its downsides. The Gilded Age made promises that it didn't keep. The end of the Civil War marked the end of slavery, fulfilling all the ambitions and wishes of the, the abolitionists. But in the end, it did the Negro very, very little, little benefit. Well, they were no longer slaves, but they were no less oppressed. Fortunes were made and lost as the economy boomed and then went bust, my fortune included. Those families that kept their fortune, the Carnegie's, Rockefeller's, Frick's, Mellon's, they were guided by the spirit of philanthropy to one degree or another. They uh, built libraries, they endowed institutions, funded good works, but it made not a dent in the lives of the working poor. Labor unions rose up to fill the vacuum left by the inequality of wealth. Shadowy societies with uh, an agenda like the Molly Maguires, well, they challenged our, our complacent view of ourselves as a just society. Immigrants from all over Europe came with their, their own values and customs to clash with the values and customs already here. Westward expansion started well before the Civil War, continued unabated with the spirit of manifest destiny running roughshod over anything indigenous. But what we got for it, for better or for worse, despite the conflict or maybe because of it, with all of its uh, shortcoming, shortcomings and inadequacies, we begin to see ourselves as one nation no longer as um, Northerners and Southerners or colonialists broken away from the mother country or immigrants displaced by hardship, but we were evolving a common identity. 
somehow we have begun to see ourselves as all of us Americans. Well, in that um, prediction of uh, the Gilded Age, uh, it's dictates, let's say. Uh, when it was time for me to turn my Huckleberry Finn into a book, I, I didn't go to my publisher. I started my own publishing company, uh, Charles L. Webster Publishing Company. Well, I named it after my uh, nephew-in-law, who was the business manager. We followed the uh, book subscription model in marketing. All of my books had been sold by subscription. I don't think people understand what that is anymore. Um, what it was, was an army of salesmen and saleswomen who went door to door all across the country representing a publishing company and selling not their books, but subscriptions to their books. What they carried with them was a small flat sample of the title. It, it would, a binding so the prospective customer could see the quality of the binding and a few pages inside that they could read. Well, when all the orders were in, uh, two things happened. One, publisher knew exactly how many copies to print up. And two, the purchaser's name would appear in the back of the book under the subscribers list. That way, everyone knew that you were a literate person. I always like to see my name in print. Oh, it, it was a perfect system. I, I have no idea why it's fallen away. Oh, there, there were bookstores uh, for snobby writers. Uh, subscription books almost never crossed their threshold. My, my writing of Huckleberry Finn was a very uh, off and on uh, process. I started writing it, then I put it down to do another project and picked it up again, only to set it down once more. Why it's a coherent book at all is a bit of a surprise. I sometimes had no idea why I was writing it. But I, I think that process of aging that it went through was probably a good thing. I think it helped to distill one of the characters in the book, uh, Jim, the runaway slave. He was, in fact, a real person. His name, well, the only name I ever knew him by was Uncle Daniel. As a lad, um, I spent, oh, much time on my uncle's farm. Uh, my, <clears throat> excuse me. You know, my real uncle, my mother's brother, um, he had a plantation and a number of slaves to work at. Now, when I say plantation, don't, don't go imagining a Greek revival mansion with white pillars out in front. His was a, a double log structure with a breezeway in between the two halves. Around the home was a wooden pallet fence to keep the pigs in. Well, down the slope behind the house was the Negro quarters. And it was in one of those cabins that many a night, the Negro children, uh, my nine cousins, my siblings, and myself gathered around Uncle Daniel's hearth as he told us his stories. Oh, it's the same stories that Joel Chandler Harris would have his uncle Remus tell us someday. It was from Uncle Daniel that I heard my favorite ghost story, the, the golden arm. Oh, the ghost story, that, that was the, that, those were the best stories. And it was always the last story of the evening. And they were the best and the most disappointing because there was nothing between them and the, unwanted bed.
Well, I've carried Uncle Daniel with me spiritually uh, all these decades. And, oh, he's been an unending friend of infinite patience as he let me rename him and put him on a raft, float him down a river into a book. I mentioned General Grant earlier. Um, he, he figured into my publishing company as well. Olivia and I were uh, leaving Chickering Hall, uh, a popular venue in New York at the time. Uh, I'd given a reading. And as we left, we met um, Mr. Gilder of the New Century Magazine Company. He offered to take us home for a late night supper. Well, during that meal, I learned that General Grant had written three articles for the magazine, the start of his memoirs. Well, I knew what that meant. A number of years before, I had tried to talk Grant into doing his memoirs, but humble man that he was, he didn't think anyone would be interested. But now he had fallen upon hard times. He had been involved with an investment company on Wall Street, uh, Grant and Ward. Uh, Grant lent his good name to the company and Ward was the financial manager. Well, when uh, the boo boom turned to bust, Ward made off with all the money. Grant's money and the investor's money. Grant was now penniless and with his reputation tarnished. And now he was writing magazine articles for paltry sums, trying to make ends meet. Well, the next morning I was in Grant's parlor demanding an explanation. Well, sure enough, the uh, century people were thinking about turning this into a book and they were going to give him 10% royalties. I told him I would give him 70% royalties if he published with me. The century people had no idea of the value of his memoirs. I did. Well, I'm happy to say it was a great success. And we took the Grant family out of, um, out of poverty. I say the Grant family, Ulysses, I soon learned, was dying of throat cancer. He put the final edits on the book a few days before he died. Well, The Ventures of Huckleberry Finn and the Grant Memoirs were both successful books for our publishing company, but the third book, um, a memoir of Pope Louis XIII, well, it was a failure. So was every book after that. Although my, my greatest failure was my financial investment in the page typesetting machine. Well, having been a typesetter, I, I knew the value of automating that process. But there were competing machines and ours lost out. Well, it never did work quite right, uh, despite me pouring my fortune into its development. I became a victim of the Gilded Age. To my rescue uh, came a man uh, most people called a robber baron. For me, he was a financial angel. Henry H. Rogers of a Standard Oil Company, a fan of my writing. Well, he took my ruined finances in hand and guided me through bankruptcy. The first thing he did, he took all of my, the rights to my works and got them assigned to Olivia so that my creditors could not lay claim to them. After the Bankruptcy, I did not have to pay my creditors in full. But 
I, to soothe my conscience, uh, I had to pay my creditors in full. I decided with Roger's uh, support and agreement and, and help, uh, I went back to the speaker's platform. I went back on tour, but this time a world tour. We took in Australia, Tasmania, New Zealand, Ceylon, India, South Africa, the British Isles, every country where English was spoken and where they knew me. I was now world famous. The technology was that the world knew me. Well, it was a success. I was able to raise enough money to pay off all of my creditors in full. But we paid a price we could never have anticipated. Our middle daughter went along with me and Olivia on the two world tour. And our youngest daughter, Jean, and our eldest daughter, Susie, stayed behind. Before we got back, Susie, our eldest daughter, died. Spinal meningitis. She died in our Hartford home. We could never live there again. Oh, look at me. I, I've gone back into family matters and forgotten my subject. What was I talking about? Oh, oh, publishing. Uh, when, did, um, when we published The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, a number of libraries immediately banned it. Well, to that point, let me quote them. The Boston Transcript. The Concord Public Library Committee has decided to exclude Mark Twain's latest book from the library. One member of the committee says that while he does not wish to call it immoral, he thinks it contains but little humor and that of very coarse type. He regards it as the various trash. The library and the other members of the committee entertain similar views, characterizing it as rough, coarse, and inelegant. In dealing with a series of experiences not elevating, the whole book being more suited to the slums than to intelligent, respectable people. You can't buy advertising like that. I think to end my little talk, I'll, I'll share with you a, a laundry list um, for my entertainment. I've I kept record of banned books, uh, the company that Huckleberry Finn keeps. And, well, it's it, it's a respectable list if I do think so myself. Uh, I'll share with you a dozen. First up, the Holy Bible. Well, let me clarify that. Um, an English translation of the Holy Bible. Uh, this was made by William Tyndale during the Reformation. Uh, the church burned him at the stake for that. Oh, here's one near and dear to my heart. Uh, New York Times, 1937. Tom Sawyer, banned in Brazil. Tom's, Mark Twain's The Adventures of Tom Sawyer was ordered removed today from the public libraries and schools of Rio de Janeiro State as part of Brazil's campaign against subversive and communistic literature. Well, they were in the throes of a, a campaign against a, a resurgence of Marxism. Uh, however, the connection between Marxist philosophy and Tom Sawyer uh, has always eluded me. On a similar vein, 1984 by George Orwell, uh, that was banned for pro-communistic sentiments. And 
at the same time banned in Soviet Russia for anti-communistic sentiments. Black Beauty by Anna Sewell in South Africa during apartheid. Couldn't put those two words together. Oh, another horse story band, uh, My Friend Flicka by uh, Mary O'Hara. Well, she used the word bitch in reference to a female dog. Oh, to be fair, the word damn also appeared. Bury my weight knee. Well, let me try that one again. Bury my heart at wounded knee by D. Brown. Uh, that was removed by a district administrator who felt it was one-sided. He was quoted as saying, if there is a possibility that something might be controversial, then why not eliminate it? Lewis Carroll's Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, banned in China, 1931. That was because he had human characters talking to animals, that is, existing on the same plane. William Shakespeare is the Twelfth Knight. Uh, that was banned, oh, let's see, how do they describe it? As encouraging homosexuality as a positive lifestyle alternative. If you recall the character Viola, uh, disguised herself as a man for protection and to be near the one she loved. Oh, his King Lear uh, had an interesting history. Uh, during the English uh, uh, Restoration, uh, they tacked a happy ending onto it. And it was performed that way for well over a century until someone finally attacked on, or I should say restored the, the original ending. Well, there, there still is hope. Candide by Voltaire. Uh, that was seized by American customs in the 1930s for obscenity. Well, Voltaire was French. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. There was no church wedding for uh, Tarzan and Jane. Uh, one more to round things out. Where's Waldo by Martin Hanford? Well, in one of the illustrations, there's a tiny woman lying topless on a beach. But you got to find her. Oh, I could go on. But I, I think I'll end this little talk by rephrasing my original um, question, which is, why does anyone become a writer? I think it's because we writers are looking for some kind of immortality. We think that if our words exist beyond us, that when we're gone, we're somehow still around. Or maybe we write to find out what we're thinking, put it down on paper, and read it back to ourselves and maybe edit it to our benefit. Or maybe we write for a greater good to let the world know who we are. Or maybe we never wanted a real job. Well, thank you. I so enjoyed inflicting myself upon you. Have a good evening. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate that. What a performance. Thank you. Um, Bev says, Charles, as always, we thank you. Oh, you're quite welcome. Uh, so uh, we have some time here. Leslie says, awesome. Thank you. Uh, we do have some time left for questions, a couple minutes here. Uh, if you'd like to drop them in the chat, I will happily uh, relay them on to Charles. Got another thank you from J.D. Peterson. Uh, uh, if you wish to drop in the chat or unmute the mic and ask yourself, whatever, whatever suits you, we're happy to do. 
uh, as people are collecting their thoughts, because you definitely gave a lot to chew on, uh, I'll get the ball rolling. I'd ask you this earlier, but I think it would be, uh, it's a good story to tell everybody. Uh, how did you decide to, as you say, fob yourself off as uh, Mark Twain? Um, well, my daughter and I used to be a storytelling team. We actually went to schools. Uh, we homeschooled her. And we ended up going to schools where she was actually performing in front of her peers as a professional. And oh, she was terrific. But she grew up and went out on her own. Um, she's actually an author in her own right now. But she left me by myself. Uh, so I had to come up with something to do. And uh, given this face, uh, I naturally fell into doing Mark Twain. And, well, let's just say there's an abundance of material to draw from. Well, most definitely. Twain was nothing if not prolific. Oh. And that actually gets to a, we had a, I had a question here uh, just sent to me. How did you go about researching for this presentation, given the amount of material to sift through? <laughs> um, well, one of the suggestions came from the library that they were doing uh, another show on the Gilded Age. Uh, and that worked very well into a program I already started developing. Uh, a lot of this information that I covered today was in his autobiography, in the first version of his autobiography. There was an extended version printed 100 years after he died, uh, back in 2010, I yeah, 2010 it was. Uh, I drew from the first version where he talked about uh, his time on the river. He talked about his publishing company. He talked about Grant. So the majority of that came from his autobiography. Okay. Yeah. That now, the good. band book list, of course, I came up on my own because I do make references to things that were published after he died. Right. No, but I, I think that's part of the charm of the charm of the show, right? Uh, yeah, I, I hope keeping, so. <laughs> between keeping tabs on things. Um, particularly when you were talking about how people communicate, I was struck by what would Twain have done with social media. I think he would have had an absolute field day with that. <laughs> oh my goodness. He was, well, he was the original rock star. He really mm -hmm. did have a worldwide uh, reputation and he was very conscious of, of the media. In fact, the white suit, that became his logo, not until the, uh, after, I think it was about 1907, he realized having an iconic presence like that. He had worn white suits before, but not like he did after. He appeared to Congress uh, when they were arguing copyrights was a big issue with him. A lot of his material had been ripped off, so he was very keen on copyright. And during those hearings, which took place in December, the middle of winter, he was wearing a white suit. And the papers hardly cover the copyright. They were talking about Twain in the white suit. He knew exactly what he was doing. Mm -hmm. No, good at, good at keeping a brand and crafting an image yes. that resonated with people. So I'm sure, I'm sure he would have quite the time commenting on all the ills of society as he said saw them. Uh, in today's day and age. Uh, we got another great discussion. Uh, thank you so much uh, from Elaine in the chat here. Uh, we are at a little after seven. Uh, if anyone else has some questions, uh, if you wish to drop them in or get on the mic, feel free to do here. We do have a little bit of time. Um, floor, is, floor is indeed open. All right, fair enough. Um, so just then a couple little housekeeping things then to close out this evening. So if you enjoyed our presentation tonight, do keep an eye on your inbox for tomorrow. Um, oh, uh, we do have one other question here. 
Sorry. Uh, why did he go with the name? Uh, um, oh, we've got a couple, actually. Oh, goodness me. Uh, why Why the name Mark Twain? Ah. Uh, that comes from his days on the river. The I, I made reference to the, the depth, the water depths. Uh, mm -hmm. It was always changing. And there was a level between uh, 12 feet of water. Uh, if you drop below 12 feet of water, uh, you were getting into dangerous waters where the boulders and the snags would rip out the bottom of a boat. If you're above 12 feet, uh, then you're in safe water. Well, that mark at 12 feet was called Mark Twain. When the leadsmen were shouting out, uh, they would shout out, you know, drawing nine, Mark Twain, which meant they'd come above the safe water. So it's a line between safe and dangerous water. So I think works perfectly for the persona he was going for, honestly. Oh, yes. Uh, One of his books was called Life on the Mississippi, where he really gets into his time on the river. It, uh, oh, there's a good read. Life on the Mississippi. I think that I believe we have that one um, definitely in book form here at the library, possibly also ebook form if you if anyone's so inclined to check it out here after hearing that recommendation. Uh, another question from Leslie, uh, where did he go? Where did Twain go after his daughter's death? Well, they never. That's not quite true. He did go back in into the house in Hartford, Connecticut one time. And at that point, he realized, no, he, they could never go back again. It was just too hard. They spend a good time pretty much kicking around Europe, which uh, I think that happened for a period even before Susie's death. They lived in New York City for a time. They lived in Italy for a while for Livy's health when it was declining. And eventually he was able, when his fortune were restored by Rogers. Uh, he built a house in uh, Reading, New York, R-E-D-D-I-N-G. Uh, oh, the name of it, he named it after one of the characters in his books, and now it escapes me. Um, nope, won't come to me. But yeah, he uh, kicked around a bit. But uh, unfortunately, that house burnt down now. Uh, Oh, I think within 10 years after he had died. But yeah, he lived a number of places. He was, he did even all of his life. He traveled quite a bit. Um, he was uh, as known as a travel writer as he was as a novelist, as much as a platform humorist. He did a lot of travel writing because he did a lot of traveling. Fair enough. Make good, write your thoughts down about where you're going and sell it. Why not? <laughs> um, if you have any other last minute questions, please do drop them in. I'm going to do two quick thoughts as we're wrapping up here. Uh, do keep an eye on your emails tomorrow because I will be sending out a what to check out next guide. Uh, if you would like to find out uh, more about Mark Twain, we do have that autobiography that Charles mentioned. It is very large though, like larger than my head large. So prepare yourself if you're going to check out that one. Uh, we do also have some of Twain's writing selected as well uh, in physical and digital form. Uh, and if you enjoyed this Gilded Age theming tonight, uh, do consider joining us again in two weeks for our encore of The Not So Gold life of the Gilded Age wife, which will be returning by popular demand. There will be some info in my email tomorrow about that as well. So make sure that you uh, follow Charles as he goes about his endeavors here. Uh, if you wish to watch this recording again or uh, his Evening Virus stories, you can find those on our YouTube channel. So thank you kindly, Charles, for this wonderful presentation. It was absolutely fantastic, and I, I know I learned a lot, so I appreciate it very much.
All right, don't see anything else in the chat. Uh, gotta enjoy the presentation very much from Bill. Uh, but to that, on that note, everybody, I think we will sign off here for the evening. So thanks all for joining us. Uh, take care and have a pleasant night. Thank you again, Charles.